Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. G. Marshall. Is there any one of us, no matter how rich or poor, who wouldn't feel a thrill if we opened a piece of ordinary seeming mail one day to read, this letter will make you a millionaire? Or, by the terms of my late client's will, I am authorized to tell you that you are a sole heir to his entire estate. That's what this story is about. Get in, Mr. Adams. Please do as he says, George. All right, all right Martha. And now, where are you taking us, Mr. Falcone? <laughs> I'm taking you and your wife for a ride, Mr. Adams. Our mystery drama, A Mexican Standoff was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Joe Silver and Catherine Byers. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Greyhound Package Express. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Of course, all of us receive this kind of mail constantly. Dear Mr. or Mrs. Blank, your retirement estate is waiting if you only solve the puzzle on page seven. Well, I won't belabor the point. Uh, come on, trash. Even more unpleasant terms have been applied to this approach to human greed and human need. And none of us are total proof against its lure. But this is the story of something else. Of a letter that might have fooled you or me or any of us listening. Something begun sheerly accidentally by an ambitious young reporter on the Nebraska Daily Journal. Down off here. Ed Grandy, City Desk. Tanya, I got your idea for the series. You want to have lunch in the spare rib and kick it around? Sure thing, Mr. Grady. We're better for an enterprising young lady reporter than the spare rib. That's where you chauvinistic pigs figure us girls began. You don't understand, Mr. Grady. Why does everyone who works for me use that same line? I mean about this. I'm not talking about someone who's out to build an image, who sees himself as the next state or national congressman or even, the Lord help us, president. This is a guy with no axe to grind. There ain't no such animal. You bet your sweet colon exclamation point and asterisk there is. Not only one, but millions of them. You know what the trouble with you is, Tana? I'm Polish. Hey, let's not get ethnical. What I was going to say... My interest is ethics, uh, but I interrupted you. Maybe it's why I put up with you. You're the only one who does. What I was going to say is that just because you're second generation, third, whatever the devil you are, you're always ready to wave the flag. So you came over on the Mayflower Watch and... it. I'm maybe seventh generation American, but who said I came over on the Mayflower? I take it back. If you had, you'd have had to be the captain. So I was three ships back. What's that got to do with it? Like this. Since Watergate, we've kind of lost our image. We'll get it back. We're still a world power. Oh, I didn't mean so much for the rest of the world. Maybe I was just thinking small, like here at home. What here at home? How we look to our own eyes, ourselves. Look, we're smack in the middle of a big bicentennial celebration, remembering how we were, what our forefathers did, how they brought us here. I think somewhere we ought to be taking a look at the best of what we are today, like George Adams. Who? I don't remember him. Maybe no one will, except the Daily Journal. But he's worth at least one day in the sun. 
Like how? Like he's 45. He's in the post office department, and he's a verger at his church. He's got four grown-up kids, two of each kind, a wife he's been married to since he was 21. He doesn't owe a nickel. He's a Boy Scout leader, member of the town council, drives the free town ambulance every Thursday afternoon and Saturday. He's on the PTA, the Good Neighbors Committee, works for ecology supervision, and heads up the Keep Our Town Clean and Bright Committee. Good Lord. What does he take for headaches? Headaches? Doesn't his halo fit just a little tight? You see, Mr. Grady, that's just the kind of cynical attitude that's destroying the country. People don't want to feel like you. They don't? No. People are just crying to believe in simple, ordinary things again. Like good neighbors. And the atoms are perfect for this. Well, you can't knock the name. Adams. And what's so bad about George? Father of our country. Uh, what's the wife's name? Martha. You gotta be kidding. You haven't heard a thing yet. What do you figure her name was before she married? If you tell me Washington, I just may be the first man to throw up a chef's salad. Oh, calm yourself. But how does this grab you for substitutes? Martha Jefferson, I tell you, this whole story is a natural. All right, what'll it cost us? Mr. Grady, can't you get it through your head that these are two simple, happy people who are not looking for a thing out of life except the satisfaction of living it the way they do? Which in my book is something very special, even if they don't know it. I just wish we were a national publication because I think George and Martha Adams would bring a breath of fresh, clean life into the whole rotten, uneasy world America has slipped into being. Okay, okay, okay. Take it easy before you knock the coffee over. I won't take it easy because I know I'm onto something good and productive and right. The Adams aren't the only people in this country like they are. I just think they're two damn good representatives of what most of our people are really all about. You know something, kid? You're so smoking hot about this, you're getting me all steamed up. Maybe I'll go for it. All right, how do you see it? A full page, or at least three to four columns op-ed. We can run it Monday through Friday with a big wrap-up in the weekend edition. And no payoff? Not a cent. What are you going to call it? Mr. Good Citizen USA. All right, Tanya. It's your baby. You got a deal. Here's good luck to Mr. George Adams. Mr. Good Citizen, USA. Did you get the mail, uh, George? Oh, I sure did. There's so much stuffed in the box, a couple of them froze right to the middle. Oh, well, I guess Hiram didn't feel like lugging it on up to the house. You gonna bring it into the kitchen? Oh, you betcha. I want to warm up. Whew. I'm sure glad I don't have to walk my route today, Martha. Oh, my, that is a load. (sighs) I knew I never should open my mouth to that reporter. Oh, no, you don't. (laughs) You thought she was real cute, and you couldn't (laughs) wait to open up and tell her all about yourself. Now, Ma, you know you're the one really talked me into it. I thought it was about time you got some recognition. Recognition? (laughs) Now, what are we going to do with all these letters? We can't even read them all, let alone answer. Well, I have to admit, I just thought it was going to be in the local papers. I didn't figure it to get spread all over the country. Mm, not only the U.S. of A. Seems like it's, well, it's got the foreign countries too. Now, look at look at this big fat one here. Why, that's special delivery. You better open it. <laughs> Me being in the post office, you should know special delivery don't mean much since the same old carrier has to deliver it, same as he does the regular mail. You always call the people up. (laughs) Well, that's because when I'm not off, there's just two of us. Hiram's all alone my day off. You got any coffee there? Sure. I'll get you some. Well, I could use it. Cold, clear to my bones. Now, let's see here what this one's all about. Maybe I should put the thermostat up, but the oil bill this month's so high. Oh, George, I don't mean to question the good Lord, but every so often I wish you and me could get away from these cold winters and just lay in the sun somewhere. Like you see in those advertisements in the papers. Here's your coffee. Go on now. Drink it while it's hot. Mm -hmm. George... What's the matter? Hmm? Well, maybe the good Lord heard what you said. Listen to this, Martha. Uh, Dear Mr. Good Citizen USA, 
I have just read your story reprinted in the overseas edition of the New York Press. As an expatriate, it restored all my pride and joy in our country, as long as it can produce men of integrity like you. Our country has done a good deal for me. I would like to repay it by doing something for a man who has done so much for it. In close, you will find two round-trip tickets for you and your wife to Mexico City, plus reservations at the Casa Contina Hotel for one month. An account has been opened in your name at the Banco de Alhambra to cover all your expenses up to $5,000. God bless you, and let me assure you, I do this only out of the goodness of your heart. Huh. From an unknown and forever anonymous admirer. Well, if that don't beat all, Mexico. When are the tickets for? Next Monday. I could be packed and ready by then. Martha! You're, you're not thinking we can go. Why ever not? You got all kinds of time coming to you at the P.O. Oh, no, it isn't that, honey. I mean, well, how do we know this isn't some kind of a stunt? You know, a, a come on. People just don't go around giving something away for nothing. You have your whole life. <laughs> you want to go? Yes, I do. But I'm not being offered it. It's you. George, dear, it's cold. You've worked hard your whole life. Never taken a vacation, used all your holiday times to do things for others. You deserve to get away where it's warm and sunny and, and exciting, and for once someone's doing something for you. It's not what I want to. I, I, I just think you ought to. Oh. Well, honey, I, I, just, I, I just don't know. How, how do I know this is all, well, like the fellow says, on the up and up? Well, why don't you let the people who got you into this check that out for you? Why not talk with Mr. Grady? Well, it all checks out, Mr. Adams. Tickets okay. Mexico City reservations are paid in advance, guaranteed. An account has been opened in your name at the bank, so I guess you're on your way. <laughs> I don't know. Somehow, I don't like to accept something for nothing. Isn't that what this is? You know, George, this is nice. Yeah, beats walking a mail route for sure. I thought I'd be scared, but I wasn't a bit. Even taking off. Oh, my, that was beautiful. Yeah, and so are you. I oh, just think. My first time ever in a plane, and I had to wait till I was a middle-aged old lady. Oh, hush up now. You, you don't look a day older than when I married you. That's so long ago. You just can't remember. Oh, I remember. I remember. I will never forget. I was the luckiest guy in the world. Still am, Martha. Just one person luckier. Me. Mm, can't you just hardly wait to get to Mexico? You're darn right. I wonder... What, dear? I wonder if that old anonymous admirer might just turn up there and make himself anonymous. Make himself what? Well, you know, make himself known who he is. And maybe what he really wants. Excuse me. Would you be Mr. and Mrs. Adams? George Adams? That's right. Well, uh, well, I reckon now you know who we are. What can I do for you? Oh, nothing for me. Just I'm here to do for you. I got a limousine outside. Take you to a hotel. Oh, well, uh, we were just going to get the bus in. That, that's all right. Oh, no, sirs. No charge. No charge, Mr. Adams. Courtesy of the hotel. And uh, you wouldn't want me to lose my job, would you? Why, no, of course not. It's very kind of the hotel. So I'll get your bags, and then you can just follow me. Uh, you just climb right in, ma'am. Why, thank you. Uh what is it, Martha? Just sit down, Mrs. Adams, and tell your husband to follow right in. I'm all right, George. Better get in, dear. Oh, just a minute, honey. I, you know, you don't sound right. Something... Oh, 
Yeah, Mr. Adams. It's a gun. And Sal has one in your back. I think you better join us. Do as he says, George, please. Well, I, I don't have much druthers, do I? Who, who are you? My anonymous friend? <laughs> That's right. Only I won't be that much longer. Hey. Hey, where are you taking us? I'm taking you for a ride, Mr. Adams. <laughs> It was all too easy, wasn't it? In this cynical world of ours, I'm afraid nobody gets anything for nothing. Free, no strings attached. But what are the strings? And what could Mr. Good Citizen USA possibly have in common with an obvious gangster? I'll return shortly with Act Two. The Adams couldn't have known it. But on leaving the airport, the big, smoothly purring limousine, instead of turning southwest for the city, headed almost due north, deeper into the hills. In the fading light, passing an occasional policia before they left the airport proper, more than once, George Adams had the impulse to try to wave or shout to them. But each time, a terrified but sensible Martha laid a restraining hand on his arm. Your wife is very wise. You wouldn't risk using that gun with cops around. Mm, possibly not, although it does have a silencer. But even if you had tried to signal one of the fuzz, he wouldn't have seen you. Why not? You didn't notice on the way in. One-way glass, Mrs. Adams. You can only see out. And, uh... Don't get any fancy ideas of grabbing the gun, Mr. Adams. You couldn't get out of here without Sal opening up from outside. Hmm. I suppose the glass between us and the driver is bulletproof? Yeah, it's all bulletproof. What, what do you want with us, Mr. Mr. Anonymous or whoever you are? You don't recognize me? Should we? I used to get a lot of press coverage. A lot more than Mr. Good Citizen here. I was number one also, only not quite in the same class. The mobsters. Uh, Fal, uh, Falcone. Gino Falcone. Sure, sure. The picture was always up on the bulletin board just a few years ago. Bulletin board? Yeah, at the post office. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot you were with the department. You have something to do with the post office, Mr. Falcone? <laughs> Not exactly. It's just that for a while there, I was a real celebrity, like your husband. One of the ten most wanted. Right, Mr. Adams? Yes, but I... I thought you were in Italy or, or somewhere. Yeah. So are most people, I hope. Including Uncle Sam. Only I ain't anymore. I'm Gino Falcone. Right here in Mexico, where the U.S. can't touch me. But, Mr. Adams, I got two million bucks in cash waiting for me in the States. And I can't get to it. So that's where you come in. I... I don't get you. You will. Just as soon as we get where we're going, I'm going to tell you just how. Sure you won't join me? No, thanks. We don't drink. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I forgot. He's a Boy Scout. Well, here's looking at you. Okay, let's get down to cases. I want you to run a little errand for me. I'm not getting mixed up in anything criminal. No, who said I was? Well, it has to do with you. It figures that way. Listen, mister, don't make it hard on yourself or me. You're going to do just what I tell you, and I'm going to tell you why. Because either you run my little errand, or you and the missus here run out of time. I'll have the both of you drop in Lake Takako for a little scuba diving party. Only you won't have no tanks or masks, just a couple of cement fins. George, why don't you let Mr. Falcone tell us what he wants? That's very sensible, lady. You just listen to your missus, George. All right. Go ahead. I'm listening. It ain't much, George. Just think of it as another mail route. Only this time, you ride first class all the way. Where? New York City. What for? 
You'll be given an address. You'll go to that address by yourself without getting in touch with no one. And you'll let yourself in with the... These keys. Only first of all, you're going to buy a crowbar. Crowbar? What for if I have the keys? That'll be for after you get in. Well, how can I walk into a building carrying a crowbar without any? You'll anybody... shove it down your trouser leg. Hook it over your belt. You'll be a little stiff-legged, but you're only going up one flight of stairs now, anyway. Look, look, this is all crazy. Shut up and listen, punk. Please, dear, let him finish. He better. Now... Once you get in, you go in the living room. The wall on your right-hand side, in the middle, is a place that sticks out a couple feet from floor to ceiling, like it used to be a fireplace, which it was. Only it's been closed up and plastered shut for years like it was just a wall, right? If you say so. There's one of them false fireplaces and mantles standing in front of it. I take all the junk off the mantle and move the fireplace. It ain't all that heavy. Then you take the crowbar, and from about two and a half feet above the floor down, you knock all the plaster out till you get to the wire lath. Rip that out, and you find two dark blue suitcases with combination locks. Bring them back to me. That's all there is to it. Well, where's Martha going to be all this time? Why, she and Sal are going to be at the hotel. Sal will be with her to see that room service is sending up two meals three times a day. And we know you're doing what you're supposed to do and keeping your mouth shut. Otherwise, Why, you... take it easy, cousin. Bring those bags back safe and sound, and you and the old lady can get started on a Mexican holiday just like you planned. Well... What's what's in those two suitcases? Why, George, you're not thinking. The money, of course. Why why can't you get it yourself, Mr. Falcone? Because a joker that used to be my best friend got me framed on a lousy income tax rap. The only way to beat it was to get out of the country and fast. Now even Italy was getting too hot for me. It looked like they might be able to extradite me. And besides, something else came up. Ah, uh, well, that don't matter now. Are you really serious about all this? Baby, I don't kid around. Never. No, I mean, this apartment. What about whoever lives there? She don't anymore. She? Your your wife? No. My mother. She died. Oh, I'm sorry. So am I. The day I read the obituary, that was the same day I read about you. I knew I had to move fast, and I figured you was the answer, so I sent the letter. Well, why me? Cousin, you got any notion what most guys could do to get their hands on $2 million cash that can't be traced? Why, they'd slit their own mother's throats to get their hands on it. You're kind of guy, sure. Oh, don't kid yourself. Almost any Joe Blow. He'd run out on his wife, his kids, anything to be that rich. So when I found out my ma had died... Knowing I couldn't take the chance on going there myself, I started figuring who I could send. And what it boiled down to was the one guy I knew I could trust all the way was Mr. Good Citizen USA. Well, what about coming back through customs? Suppose they want those bags opened. I'm going to tell you how much I trust you. I want to give you the combination. But they got false bottoms and you're going to have clothes on top. Only, uh, they ain't gonna open your bags. Well, there's no way you can be sure of that. Ooh, but the best. You think anyone's gonna fuss over John Wayne's luggage or Hubert Humphrey or Billy Graham? Same way they ain't gonna have a worry in the world about you as long as they know who you are. Well, how would they know that? Trust me to get that to the press. Number one citizen off for Mexico vacation. They think it kind of strange. I mean... Not even knowing us real well, but George would be going alone without me. You left ahead of time from Nebraska, Mrs. Adams, so your husband could fly to New York for a secret conference on a new high position for the elections. Everything can be covered. You better believe it. Now, look, I'm playing for all the marbles here, 
I need that dough bad enough to risk anything. All right. That's enough talk. Let's get moving. Martha? You just do what has to be done, George. The Lord will provide like he always does. Well, it just doesn't seem right, mister. Where'd all that money come from? Why, you care. I mean, next to your missus there. Yeah, I guess you're right. Okay. Okay, let's get it over with. Let's get those suitcases. All right, Mr. Adams. You'll go down the back staircase and out to the rear. Your driver will be waiting for you. We get going. Well, are you going down with me? You kidding? Me and the missus will be here. Nice and cozy. Waiting for you to get back. What's to worry? It's a suite with two bedrooms. Look, if you so much as... You li- come on, crumb. The lady should excuse me, but she ain't my type. Don't worry about me, George. I'll be all right. Just get back as soon as you can. Well, I have to be back on the flight they booked, honey. I'll see you then. Bye, darling. Don't worry about me. God's with us. Same as he was when he gave you to me. He won't take you away. Okay, Adams, you got company to make sure you get on that plane. So don't break it up, man. You got as much riding on this as the rest of us. There. Queen of Spades. The unlucky lady. Now, I know you don't want that, Mrs. Adams. Hey. Hey, Mrs. Adams. What, so? I discarded. Nothing you want. Didn't you see? I'm sorry, no. My thoughts were very far away. I was just thinking of George in New York. You discarded the Queen of Spades. Yeah. I think I'll take it. It's beginning to get dark here. I suppose it must be really dark there. Yeah, two hours later, after dinner already. Well, you're going to discard? Oh, yeah. Well, I have gin. Oh, no, again? Oh, boy, what luck. It's a good thing we're playing for pennies. I wish that was the game George was in. He must be at that apartment now. Hold it right there. Don't even breathe. I've been waiting for someone like you. In the strange apartment, poor George Adams finds his backbone turning to jelly with total guilt. While his stomach churns with a kind of terror that most of us, thank heaven, only feel in nightmares from which we gratefully awake. But George Adams is awake and is guilty, and this nightmare will not go away. I'll return shortly with Act Three. The crowbar in George's hands has already made two deep and devastating bites into the plaster wall. He stands, his arms raised for the third blow, the bar balanced in his hands, his eyes blinking against the powdered particles. Behind him is a presence, still only a voice, but in George's mind, a voice as chilling as the voice of conscience, or the voice of doom. You heard me, buddy. I got you covered. Now you just keep your hands over your head like they are and drop that crowbar. All right, now just lean forward and put your hands high on the wall. Now, come on. Come on, move. Like that? What are you, a joker? You've never been frisked before? All right, okay. Okay, you're clean. You can put your arms down now and turn around. 
Who are you? I... Who are you? I'm asking the questions. This isn't your apartment. How'd you get in here? Well, how did you? I had a key. So did I. Where did you get your key? Oh, I could ask you the same question. Only you're not in the spot to force any answers. I am. This is my enforcer. Now, come on. Who are you? You want me to make you take off your jacket, look through your wallet? I guess at the point of a gun, I couldn't stop you. Okay. My name's George Adams. You one of Falcone's boys? I don't know what you mean. All right, I'll spell it out. Who sent you here? Abruzzi? No. Louis Carlotta? I never heard of him. I, it couldn't have been. What, what, was it Gino Falcone himself? Okay, don't bother to answer. Brother, that's a rocker. So he's alive. Who? Falcone. You know something? You're really a hard case. Or, or, or what? Or if you're not feeble-minded, you just might be... So wait a minute. Maybe we should get off this merry-go-round, just start over. My name is John McCarthy, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Here, my identification. Shoot. What? Is, is this for real, Mr. McCarthy? What are you, putting me on? What else do you want, my fingerprints? No, it just... Well, I never saw an identification card or anything from an FBI man before. I never even saw an FBI man before. I don't know. I never bumped into anything like you before either. You think we can talk now? Well, sure. Anything you want to know. Okay. Suppose we start with just what you're doing with a crowbar in an apartment that doesn't belong to you, knocking down the walls. I knew your face was familiar. Sure, sure, I read about you in the paper. So that's how you got here. Yeah, but what I don't understand is how you... How I got here? Uh Uh-huh. Well, when Mrs. Fortaleone was dying, she called my mom. They've known each other most of their lives, and she was all alone and turned to her best friend. Mom asked me to go over with her, but we were too late. Well, she she asked for Gino just before she died. I figured he didn't get here in time for her, but he might in time for me. To arrest him? To kill him. I took a blood oath to get even with that lousy murdering skunk. Well, why? He was once my best friend, see? We grew up together on the Lower East Side. Me, Gino, and Frankie. Frankie? My kid brother. We used to live in the same tenement. The McCarthy's and the Portaleones. I don't understand who these Portaleones are. Well, didn't you notice the name on the mailbox downstairs? I didn't look. I just had the apartment number. Well, that's Gino's family name. When we were around 15, his father died and his mother married again, a bum named Falcone. He walked out on her in a couple of years, but not before he'd stolen her blind and settled Gino into being a sneak thief and then into the numbers and then prostitution, drugs, finally to tie in with the mob. Well, that's okay. That ended a friendship. But what a man does is his own business. Only he didn't have to drag Frankie down in the muck with him. Well, how, how did Gino manage to do that? We were just tough kids. Like you had to be in our neighborhood. Gino was the toughest, see? We all sort of looked up to him because he was smart, too, see? But Frankie worshipped him. Gino could do no wrong. <laughs> yeah, he steered Frankie wrong, all right. It's too bad he isn't still around to see it. He died? He died. How? I shot him. What? I killed my own brother. How, how could you... Well, you don't think I did it deliberately, do you? Then how? How did you? When we went to pick up Gino on the income tax rap, <laughs> Frankie was one of the jerks who tried to protect him while he slipped away and left them all holding the bag. Frankie's thanks from Gino was a bullet in the gut. And it had to be my bullet. Oh. I, I don't know what to say, Mr. McCarthy. There's nothing to say. There's no words. Just just this. I got a special bullet waiting for Gino. Now I know where to find him. And at last I can deliver it personally. No. What do you mean, no? You're not going to find out from me how to get to him. What side of the law are you on? 
I always thought that would be easy to answer, but now, as long as there's any danger to Martha, there's only one law I'm going to follow. Anything that protects her. Suppose I arrest you right now and you don't get back with the money. Then what do you do? You wouldn't do that, Mr. McCarthy. You lost a brother. It wasn't your fault, but it was your hand that killed him. You going to force me to do that to my wife? I'll tell you what. First off, let's you and me find out if the money's there. And then we'll talk. So go ahead. You get busy with that crowbar. Okay. So, the suitcases were there, all right. Yeah. All right, now let's see what's in them, huh? You know how to open these? Well, he had to give me the combination so I could pack some clothes in them in case customs made me open them. Well, let's get them open. Uh, just give me a minute here. Let's see, uh, 13 right, 8 left, 24 forward. Yeah, that's it there. Oh, it's empty. Let's have a look. No, 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 there's a false bottom. Here. Yeah. There it is. Well, how do you like the looks of that? Oh, I never saw a thousand dollar bill before. Or a million in cold cash. We'll check, but I think we can take it for granted the other bag holds the same. Now, where do we go from here? I know where I go. You be careful with that, Mr. Adams. You're not used to handling guns. No, I'm... I'm... I'm handling this one until I get my wife away safe from the danger she's in. Now, let's be sensible, Mr. Adams. You're not going to start shooting. And the government has no intention of jeopardizing a citizen's safety, especially our number one citizen. I'll tell you what. Yeah? Let's make a deal. A deal? What kind of a deal? Your plane doesn't leave till tomorrow morning. You open the other suitcase... And you let me have it overnight. Oh, no. I'm not going to do anything with the money except have it marked. Oh, no. No, then, then Falcone would know. I can assure you no one but the Bureau could possibly know. At least we'll have a way of tracing him after you're out of the picture. What? I don't know. How, how can I trust you? How can you do anything else? I hate to point it out to you, Mr. Adams, but we are now at a point that is known by many names but which in this case can be called the Mexican standoff. If you don't trust me in the law, who else can you trust? Oh, thank heaven. I thought you'd never get here. Just relax, George, relax. I had to wait till the reporters were through with you. Is the money still there? Trust me. And covered up with a nice selection of summer suits for a Mexican vacation. Now, I heard your plane called, so so long and good luck. I want to thank you, Mac. And once I get Martha out of this, I hope you nail him. Don't you worry. This is the one that won't get away. How do you mean? Vamos, amigo. Your plane's about to take off. Hasta la vista. <laughs> Mr. Adams? Yeah. We're, we're not heading for the city. Where are you taking me, Sal? To deliver the money to Mr. Falcone. Well, where's my wife? Like I told you. She's waiting for you. Why don't you do just the same? What? Wait. It'll all be laid out for you when the time comes. seems to be here. You had no trouble? I just followed instructions. Pretty good hiding place, huh? Why not a bank? A safe deposit box? No, Mrs. Adams, no chance. Big Brother government knew every step I made, except this one. All right, now, I, I did what you wanted. I brought you what you sent me for. Now, can Martha and I go... You anxious for that gay Mexican holiday? I don't want any holiday at your expense. Now, look, I never go back on my word. 
Only now I can promise you both a much longer one to share together. Now you put that gun away or I'll take it away from you. I don't think you'd make it. George, don't. Don't you see? If he doesn't do it, he'll have one of his guns will take care of us. Now run, Martha. I won't let him get away with it. Oh. <laughs> Are you all right, George? Mac. Mac, what are you doing here? <laughs> Marines have landed courtesy jet military plane that beat you here by a couple of hours. And a beeper the FBI built into one of the suitcase handles. Oh, but you promised. Now, I asked you to trust me. Now, there's a difference. Come on, George, face it. I knew even if you didn't, the moment you gave Gino the money, you were as good as dead. And your wife. Martha. Well, no, no, she... no, 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 she's fine, she's fine. And so are you. Well, it creased your skull. You'll have a headache, but you'll live. Oh. And Gino? Gino died rather suddenly from lead poisoning. Probably the best way out. He left enough money to cover his back taxes, and he won't cost the government a wasted bundle and a long trial. Well, I, I suppose you're glad you had your revenge, Mac. You finally used that bullet, huh? No. I'm kind of lucky, come right down to it. Mexican police fired such a barrage, I'll never know what bullet killed him. But forget about me. Let's get you to Martha so you can enjoy that vacation. Uh, I wouldn't touch a penny of Gino's dirty money. Well, that's up to you. As it happens, you won't have to. Remember your wanted poster? There was a $10,000 reward for information leading to Gino's capture. Well, that's all yours. You can still have that Mexican adventure Martha wants so much. Only this time, it'll be on the U.S. government. <laughs> that ends well. And this could hardly have ended better. Extradition is a tangled web. And so many crooks use it to entangle legitimate government prosecution against them. This time, the spider was caught in his own sticky web. I'll be back shortly. So Martha and George did have their Mexican vacation after all. The money credited to the bank account in their name by Gino was covered by the reward and the plane fares and every incidental expense except one, the trip to New York and back to pick up the suitcases and the money. That was an expense that Martha refused to allow George to defray. It had cost both of them enough in anguish and suspense so that neither of them should have to pay for it in money as well, which I wouldn't argue against. Would you? Our cast included Joe Silver, Catherine Byers, Robert Dryden, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Greyhound Package Express and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater.